The global humanitarian response to the Armenian genocide was sparked by a cablegram sent by Henry Morgenthau to the US Secretary of State in September 1915, in which he said, destruction of the Armenian race is progressing rapidly. Morgenthau proposed the formation of a relief fund in the United States in order to provide means to save some of the Armenians who had survived. Shortly afterwards, with the support of President Woodrow Wilson, a relief organization called the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief was established in New York by prominent American civic, religious, and business leaders. The organization was eventually incorporated by an act of Congress in August 1919 and renamed Near East Relief. By that time, almost every state in the United States had a Near East Relief Committee. The end of the First World War offered a glimmer of hope for the relief and rehabilitation of the tens of thousands of Armenian refugees. Unfortunately, peace was short-lived. The rise of a Turkish nationalist movement in 1919 resulted in renewed persecution of Armenians, creating another humanitarian crisis. In response to the situation, the Executive Committee of the Near East Relief Organization decided to internationalize the relief effort. As part of their strategy, they enlisted the services of the Reverend Loyal Wirt, a congregational minister from California and a well-known social visionary. Wirt had a long history of missionary and humanitarian work. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, he established hospitals and social service centers in places like Alaska, the gold fields of California, and even as far away as my home country, Australia. During the First World War, he served as a Red Cross commissioner on the Western Front. He was among the first team of American relief workers who sailed on a flotilla of ships from New York to the Near East in January 1919 to provide direct humanitarian aid to the Armenian genocide survivors. And I have a photo up there on the right of Wirtz among the first team of Americans who were, who were there. He witnessed firsthand the deplorable condition of the Armenian refugees and orphans in Turkey and Syria. Wirt's new mission was to establish Armenian relief committees across the globe to form what he called a chain of mercy from one end of the world to the other. Equipped with publicity materials such as photographs and moving pictures, Wirt embarked upon his mission from San Francisco on January 14, 1922, and after establishing a relief committee in Hawaii, he arrived in Japan in early February, lodging at the Imperial Hotel Tokyo. There were quite a number of American and Europeans in Tokyo at that time, and it was to this community that Wirt first addressed his appeal. He succeeded in forming a general committee composed of American businessmen and missionaries with the US Ambassador Charles Warren as chairman. The Armenian relief movement gained momentum and at foreign, foreign social groups, lodges, clubs, churches, and garden parties, Wirt was invited to speak. At the time of Wirt's departure from San Francisco, a major international conference was taking place called the Washington Conference. The purpose of the conference was to limit the naval arms race and work out security agreements in the Pacific area. It was the first international conference in the United States and the first arms control conference in history. Advising the Japanese delegation at the conference was an influential informal diplomat, Viscount Eiichi Shibusawa. Who was he? Born in a village in what is now Fukaya, Japan, Shibusawa developed an eye for business early on, helping with the family's farm and indigo business. He began studying history and Confucius philosophy at an early age and in his 20s, he traveled to Tokyo to study his interests further. At the age of 27, he visited France and other European countries as a member of the Japanese delegation to the World, Paris World Exposition in 1867. It was during this trip that Shiwasawa observed modern European societies and cultures for the first time and realized the importance of industrial and economic development. Inspired by what he had learned, he founded one of Japan's first joint stock companies. Afterwards, he was invited by the Japanese government to become a member of the Ministry of Finance 
through which he was able to be a driving force in Japan's modernization and its opening to the outside world. After resigning from the Ministry of Finance in 1873, Shibusawa became the president of the First National Bank of Japan, which had been established under his guidance while a minister. With the bank as a base, he devoted himself to founding and encouraging all kinds of business. He became involved in almost every enterprise associated with the country's development, founding fisheries, railways, printing companies, steamship companies, steel plants, gas and electric industries, oil and mining concerns, and much more. Shibusawa applied a set of ideas that he called the unity of morality and economy, whereby he attempted to merge Confucian ethics with market capitalism. He believed that capitalists should place a strong emphasis on righteousness and benevolence, avoiding greed-orientated profit, placing the public interest first, while still engaging in competition. Using this doctrine, he was involved with some 600 social welfare organizations. A member of Japan's intellectual and business elite, Shibusawa developed a strong interest in US-Japanese relations. He, he led the first large-scale Japanese business mission to the United States in 1909 at a time of tense US-Japan relations. He had many American friends in the United States and in Japan. He sat on a YMCA committee in Tokyo, and in 1916, he founded the US-Japan Friendship Committee, through which he played an important role as a bridge between the two countries. Shibusawa returned home from the Washington Conference only shortly before Wirt had arrived in Japan. The following is based on the account recorded by Wirt on how the two met. Word was received through the Reverend Gilbert Bowles, a longtime American missionary in Japan, that a group of leading Japanese men were interested to learn about Wirt's mission. Gilbert was held in high esteem by the Japanese, and no foreigner had a better command of the Japanese language. Under the guidance of Gilbert, Wirt was taken to the Imperial Bank and ushered to the director's room. Acting as an interpreter, Gilbert introduced Wirt to a number of Japanese men including Eiichi Shibusawa. Sitting at the head of a long table, Shibusawa asked Wirt who the Armenians were and why they needed help. After a little geography and history, Wirt described details of Armenian suffering dur during the war and the current plight of refugees. Shibusawa interrupted and asked, why did you not come to us with your appeal? He added, was it because we are Buddhists and you thought we would not help Christians in distress? We have read your speeches as reported in the Japan Advertiser, an English language daily, and we thought we would like to help, even if we have not been invited to do so. Unknown to you, one of our Japanese papers published your appeal, and here is your result. Shibusawa handed over to Wirt a check for $11,000, about $150,000 in today's terms. Shibusawa accepted the chairmanship of the Armenian Relief Committee of Japan, which was headquartered at Kajimachi, Tokyo. He immediately wrote a letter to 100 Japanese businessmen, inviting them to attend a lecture by Wirt in the hope of arousing their interest in the Armenian Relief Appeal. Along with 15 other national committees, the Japanese Armenian Relief Committee became a member of the Geneva-based International Near East Association. The association was to increase the efficiency of all organizations seeking to relieve suffering and promote the social, economic, and industrial wel welfare of those in the Near East who have been rendered destitute by war or other co causes beyond their control. The association's committee included Dr. Inazo Nitobe, a League of Nations official and a member of Japan's House of Peers. Contributions for the Armenian Relief Appeal began to flow from all classes of Japanese society, from ordinary people to government ministers, leading businessmen, and royalty. A Japanese girls' school sponsored, assumed the full responsibility of two Armenian orphans. Now, while humanitarian advocacy was taking place in Japan, the captain and crew of a Japanese ship, the Tokei Maru, found themselves in the midst of a humanitarian catastrophe. Hundreds of thousands of Greek and Armenian refugees had fled to the shores of Smyrna 
as Turkish nationalist troops entered and occupied the city in September 9, 1922. The Turkish occupation was followed by the usual massacre and deportation of Armenian and Greek civilians. A fire broke out in the Armenian quarter four days later, which destroyed much of the city. Having full view of the catastrophe were 20 warships and freighters stationed in the harbor, including one from Japan. Many foreigners witnessed the Japanese ship mobilized to rescue the frantic refugees. An American, Anna Burge, witnessed the desperate refugees on the wharves as Smyrna began to burn. Men, women, and children could be seen swimming around in the hope of rescue until they drowned. Anna wrote, in the harbor at the time was a Japanese freighter, which, which had just arrived loaded to the decks with a very valuable cargo of silks, laces, and china, representing many thousands of dollars. The Japanese captain, when he realized the situation, did not hesitate. The whole cargo went overboard into the dirty waters of the harbor, and the freighter was loaded with several hundred refugees who were taken to safety to Greek shores. The humanitarian action of the Japanese ship was also recorded by many other, other foreign observers, including Armenian and Greek survivors of the tragedy. But more about this will be covered late, later by Misak Kaleshan. Back home, the Armenian relief movement continued with Japan's participation in Near East Relief's annual International Golden Rule Sunday, which began to be observed in 1923. The passage from the Gospel of Matthew 7.12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, was the motto for the designated Golden Rule Sunday. The general method of observance was to provide for their Sunday dinner approximately the same menu that is provided by the nearest relief to the thousands of orphans under their care, and to reflect on the needs of the orphans. Then to make such an offering or pledge for their support as we would like as we would wish to have made to our own children if conditions were reversed. Without a doubt, the universal moral principle behind the Golden Rule Sunday would have strongly resonated with Eiichi Shibusawa, who was an ardent follower of Confucian ethics and philosophy and a sincere advocate for helping the less fortunate. Prin Japan's Prince Tokugawa observed the Golden Rule Sunday and sent a generous amount of money accompanied by a beautiful personal letter to the Near East Relief Organization. He also took a leading part in supervising and distributing literature to, Jap to other Japanese statesmen and to all members of the House of Peers. And regarding Japan's participation in the Golden Rule Sunday, a Near East Relief publication in 1926 stated, even the cynic must grant that the forwarding of these golden rule contributions of goodwill from the Buddhists and Christians of Japan in the Far East to New York for transmission to the Christian orphans of the Near East is prophetic of more wholesome and friendly international relations. Another important Japanese link to Armenia was through a Burmese-born Armenian, Diana Apkar who lived in Japan from 1891 until her death in 1937. Apkar was a prolific writer, businesswoman, and diplomat. Most notably, she was made consul of the Republic of Armenia to Japan during the short-lived Armenian Republic from 1918 to 1920. It was a diplomatic post which allowed her to speak in the name of a sovereign state when reaching out to individuals and institutions. In this way, Diana was able to secure from the Japanese government special approval to allow Armenian refugees to enter Japan from Russia. This approval alleviated distress among the refugees and helped them find permanent settlement in the United States and elsewhere while in transit from Japan. Unfortunately, we haven't yet discovered any record of Diana meeting with or mentioning Shibusawa, but that does not mean that it didn't happen. Due to the 1923 Great Kanto earthquake, all of Diana's records and personal belongings were destroyed and lost with a collapsed house. Hopefully one day, documentation will surface which links these two prominent individuals. Sadly, Eiichi Shibusawa passed away in 1931, but his legacy continues today 
not only in Japan's industrial development, but in the area of internationalism and humanitarian relief. When Armenia was struck by a major earthquake on December 7, 1988, Japan was among the first nations to respond by sending a rescue team and relief supplies. Armenia responded likewise when the powerful earthquake and tsunami struck Japan on March 11, 2011. The Japanese International Cooperation Agency continues to assist Armenia in many ways by improve, improving basic infrastructure, promoting small and medium-sized enterprises, and strengthening measures for disaster prevention. Only a few weeks ago, the Japanese government contributed a generous amount to Armenian refugees from Syria to help them establish themselves in Armenia. Japan and Armenia are countries that share a rich cultural heritage and a long history of civilization. They are geographically far apart, but they were brought together a century ago by a humanitarian bond that helped the Armenians survive as a people and a nation. For Japan, this response was an early manifestation of the humanitarian ethos that forms part of their nation's engagement with international movements today. Thank you. Thank you, Vic, and one more round of applause for that outstanding and thorough presentation. <laughs> And as a reminder, if you have a question, please write it down on the card and send it to the person on the aisle where it'll get picked up. Uh, again, our next speaker has already been introduced, but he is the great-great-grandson of Ichi Shibusawa. Please welcome Mr. Ken Shibusawa.